We are now in Pulpi, near Almeria, in southern Spain. Here in the eastern flank of the Aguillon range, we can still see the remains of mining facilities that were operated from the middle of the 19th century until well into the 20th century. This mountain has been drilled with numerous mining galleries, such as this one we are now walking through, called Quintal Pensara, or who would have thought, also known as La Mina Rica, or the rich mine. Here within these tunnels and chimneys, excavating these walls and sliding through these narrow passages, miners ripped minerals such as lead and iron. Surely they would sometimes find beautiful gypsum crystals, which eventually they would offer to their patrons or sell to collectors. But by a few inches, they missed the most beautiful treasure hidden in the Mina Rica. Amateur mineralogists digging in abandoned mines in search of samples for their private collections would hit the jackpot 50 years later. Here, behind a small and inconspicuous cavity, just like many others in the rock, lay hidden the great geode of Pulpi. This geode is an egg-shaped cavity measuring 25 feet long, seven feet wide, and about five feet tall, and its walls are covered by enormous gypsum crystals of a near-perfect transparency. In a place like the geode of Pulpi, one cannot help but to recall the original meaning of the word crystal. Supercooled water. In fact, the sheer transparency of the crystals covering this geode makes them look like large blocks of ice. In some of the Pulpi crystals, we can still see small impurities made of iron and manganese, which are markers of their growth stages. Because all crystals grow as their composing molecules slowly stick to the surface of them. The glue in this process is the chemical bond that links the molecules in the crystal. It's somewhat like playing Tetris. Just like in the game, the slower the molecules adhere to the arranged surface of the crystal, the better will be the quality of the arrangement, and therefore, the quality of the crystal itself. In order to prove this process through an experiment, we went to the science park of Granada in Spain. Here, we will perform a simple test with the help of some students who won a high school crystallization contest. We will heat two identical dissolutions of a specific salt and let them cool down in order to form crystals. One of them will be locked into a styrofoam container in order to let it cool down slowly, while the other will cool down faster out in the open. The results are evident. The dissolution that cooled down slowly formed fewer crystals, but these crystals were significantly larger than those created by the fast cooling dissolution. <laughs> the big crystals of Segobriga and the geode of Pulpi must have formed very slowly to become the largest gypsum crystals in Europe. 
why, when, how. At this point, there was no turning back. I was now captivated by the beauty and the mystery of those crystals, and it became an obsession for me to find out their origin and how they were formed. I went through the literature on the subject in search of a clue. Any information about those crystals or any others of similar size. I found out that on the other side of the Atlantic in North America, the mineral world was holding even more impressive scenarios. Reading an old book, I learned that hidden in the depths of the Mexican desert of Chihuahua, a cave was discovered in 1910 which became famous for its spectacular gypsum crystals. It was dubbed La Cueva de las Espadas, or the Cave of the Swords. It was located in a mining town called Naika, and there I went to study those crystals. We are in the desert of Chihuahua in northern Mexico, the harsh and inhospitable scenario of many Western-style films. In fact, we are traveling through a desert that was home to the Apache tribe in the 19th century. Here we find a mountain called Naika in the language of the Taramaica Indians, which means the mountain that gives shade to the desert. It's a mountain that hides one of the world's largest reserves of lead, silver and zinc. The mineral was first exploited during the 19th century by gambusinos, self-employed miners who would extract metal-rich minerals almost from the surface. But there was still more mineral beneath the galleries, already flooded by subterranean waters. Industrial, planned, machine-based exploitation began by the end of the 19th century. For more than 60 years, the Nyka mine has been continuously exploited. In 1951, Mexico started to control ownership, and since 1998, mining activity is 100% Mexican, controlled by the Peñoles group. We are walking down the San Francisco ramp along with engineer Roberto Villasuso. Roberto is the chief of exploration at Nyka and the man who best knows the geology of this mine. The ramp is a tube-shaped road about five meters in diameter, which zigzags downwards to a depth of 2,700 feet, in which today we find the mining front. We stop at a depth of 390 feet, the location of the cavity found in 1910 that I have come to visit. This cavity, currently accessible through a wooden platform pathway, is a corridor about 980 feet long, and its walls are entirely covered by gypsum crystals, watching your every move like menacing swords, each measuring between one and one and a half feet. Everything, floors, walls, ceiling, is crystallized. And it must have been even more so because the abandon and plundering are evident. These crystals were formed when this corridor was totally flooded by waters rich in salts. Some of them have a darker tonality due to the presence of particles of clay and iron oxide. This indicates that the cave was flooded in an intermittent way, with waters closer to the surface and richer in oxygen. In fact, at the depth level of the cave, at about 390 feet, we can find today the level of these subterranean waters. 
This cave, this corridor of glittering crystal walls, is the Cueva de las Espadas of Naika.